Welcome back to Having a Gas, the podcast that talks to the great and the good of the creative industries. Today, I'm having a gas with Jason Spencer from ITV. Thanks for coming to talk to me because uh, I'm sure that you've got a lot more important things to do. <laughs> Absolutely not. Not on a wet Wednesday morning. Here. It is pretty bleak. Uh, what, 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 what's your official title at ITV? Uh, I'm Business Development Director, business development. which is um, a posh way of saying sales. Sales. And do they, I presume with um, a network like ITV, they give you some pretty hefty targets. Yeah, um, it's, I mean, I mean, ITV as, as a business, um, a lot of the revenue is driven through advertising. It's hugely profitable part of the business, so it gets a lot of scrutiny. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. I've no doubt. Instagram. This is really interesting because as a punter and as a layman for years, people have always said, and I've not been able to answer, they're like, who, who pays for stuff to go on TV when it's not on the BBC? Who's like, who, who pays for it? And obviously you can answer that very specifically, can't you? Because it's advertiser funded. So, yeah. so, so you know, we spend about a billion pounds making programmes each year and uh, we make, or, uh, simplistically, about 1.8 billion pounds in advertising revenue. And we make money from studios and direct consumer as well. But that helps to fund the programmes that everyone loves watching. Yeah. And that always has done. Yeah, and it's um, a little understood phenomenon about what, you know, drives the cost, let's say, of a 30-second spot on Coronation Street, you know, and or what it is that, what happens, how do you know if something's going to be, uh, going to have a lot more eyeballs on it? How can you tell who's watching and all of that feeds well, into it? Well, given this is, this is, Gas Creative um, uh, podcast, uh, rather than the the Economist. I'll, I'll keep it dead simple, but, cool. but, but essentially, it's a supply and demand yeah. mechanism. Certainly, with airtime, it's different with video on demand. Mm -hmm. So you've got eyeballs on one side, supply. You've got advertisers wanting to advertise on the other side, demand, and that is a continually moving uh, equilibrium. So you took uh, the start of lockdown last year. We're all watching a lot more telly because we're all at home. Uh, but advertisers didn't want to advertise because they couldn't sell as much stuff. So you had reduced demand, increased supply. Now we're in a position where we're all out and about more, where supply is down a bit versus, say, a couple of years ago, and demand is going through the roof. So you're wow. kind of managing kind of a inflationary, deflationary market on an ongoing basis. That really is surprising as well, because I would have thought everyone's at home, surely everyone wants to start driving ad revenue through the roof, but you're saying there was literally the means to produce stuff and sell stuff was just so down. Well, I, I think it was certainly a lot of sectors like retail, which we, we've been dependent on, um, you know, what, what, what many of them are closed and not as many of them have been able to shift to digital channels as quickly. Um, what we did find was that uh, a lot of... Uh, Companies scaled up very quickly, a lot of the online service businesses, and you've seen a lot of disruptor businesses. So take the car market at the moment, yeah. the, the growth of, say, a kazoo or a cinch, really disrupting that model on car buying. But it's, you know, there's a lot of things outside of our control. The economy at the moment, yeah. the, the lack of microchips for cars and, and mobile phones, you know, we, we work with what there is out there. Yeah, uh, it's it, it really is remarkable how much stuff has shifted and changed over the last... Uh, certainly the last 18 months. But beyond that, the last five years, we're already spiraling in terms of technological progress and development. Uh, how does ITV, uh, or, you know, something like ITV, compete with the new landscape of Disney Plus, Netflix, Amazon Prime, on demand, that is uh, paywalled? Harshly? Yeah, it's, well, it's, they're very different business models. Um, they are not advertiser funded, they're subscription funded, not dissimilar. I mean, Sky is obviously driven a lot by subscriptions in the UK, whilst it has an advertiser model as well. Um, I, I think it's fair to say, without giving you the entire recent history of ITV, but, but we've driven a huge dig digital transformation that's accelerated over the last couple of years. And that's been accelerated because of uh, the growth of Disney Plus, Netflix, et cetera, and, and which is driven by our own behaviours. So what we've evolved because consumers' behaviour has evolved mm -hmm. in terms of media consumption. Um, and, and so the way we compete is by trying to scale up as quickly as possible in that space. So if you look at something like ITV Hub at the moment, we've got 34 million registered users on there and the data that sits behind yeah. that, and we can talk about data in a bit. Um, and, and that's an advertiser-funded model. So, so if you choose to uh, watch the, pro if you want to watch the programs on there, there's a value exchange. You'll watch a small number of adverts in order to watch those programs. We do have an ad-free model, mm -hmm. which you can pay to have ad uh, with, without advertising, but it's a much, much smaller number of people who choose to pay for that. So people are happy mm -hmm. to watch nice adverts, quality adverts, and watch programs. And that's now a growing part of our 
uh, overall viewing. Yeah. For certain programs like Love Island, it's a huge part. It just depends on the demographics and where those shows are running. It's interesting that the people we speak to a lot are obviously on the creative side of advertising and there's a lot of discussion about how the um, short form media space has, let's say, affected uh, positively or negatively. Sometimes the tone is negative. Affected the quality of adverts because when you've got the brand saying we need to capture every everything for a 360 campaign in this shoot. So it's an, let's say it's an Asda Christmas advert. We need to capture everything for TV, for cinema. We need to also capture the Instagram assets, the YouTube assets, all in the same place. Meaning that people have to think in a bizarrely more constrained way considering, you know, the explosive media space that's out there. Um, are you seeing with things like IT, ITV Hub and VOD, uh, do you think the sort of, the, the quality is uh, in, improving there or, or do you think it's... Um, the quality of the ads? Yeah, the creative. Well, it's an interesting question you asked there because I think, I think one of the real challenges for creative agencies of all sorts is to think about their capabilities to deliver this breadth of assets and thinking about how you can repurpose and whether you start with a TV ad mm -hmm. and then think about how it moves across other platforms or whether you start somewhere else and then think about how it moves to TV. And I think depending on which creative agency you speak to, they'll approach it in different ways for different briefs. But one thing we have done over increasingly over the last 18 months to two years is well, we recognise that when, when people spend money on advertising, that they're, they're doing it to drive a, some sort of return on investment and yeah. look at the effectiveness. And they need to measure that effectiveness. Too often, the, the way that effectiveness is measured is in looking at the media platform or channel itself. Right. Does TV advertising work? Whereas actually the quality of the adverts is really key. So we've partnered with a, uh, an organisation called System One, who are a great research company. They use Daniel Kahneman's scale of emotional resonance. Mm -hmm. So seven different measures, that from happiness to anger, and worst of all, neutrality. Yeah. Um, and they work with us to, and, and with a number of people in the UK and US to measure advertising. Really, really powerful way, both from concept testing to post campaign. It just shows how you can make ads emotionally engaging, which is what, what brands are trying to do. Yeah. I mean, by definition, the thing is to stand out. And um, that, that was uh, sort of raised, you know, I raised an eyebrow, not in a suspicious way. He got a smile at me there mentioning Dan Kahneman because we just uh, spoke to Rory Sutherland last week in uh, right. Ogilvy and he's a big behavioral yeah. science guy and often name drops that he's had lunch with Dan Kahneman last week or, some, or someone like that, you know, so. But yeah, the psychology of, uh, you know, of human behavior playing into how, how and when you, you know, make things and put it on uh, is something that I had no idea it was as, as big as it is. The reason I'm on my laptop right now is because you triggered something, a, a memory when you said, you know, there's this misconception about, what would you call it, the quality of the media channel itself determining how effective one thinks the advertising is. And there was a thing, I think I mentioned this to you before uh, a week or two ago saying I was going to read this to you and just get your response on the spot. I'm going to keep the author of this post anonymous, um, but uh, they drew a lot of attention on LinkedIn for saying this and they said, ITV is charging 100k for one ad spot during Love Island. Here's why the brands that buy will never see return on investment. Traditional advertising is dead. You can't track the results. So how do you know if you've seen any kind of return? You don't. That's why it's pointless. If you're going into a contract with the hope that your website hits will go up or sales might increase, then you are bound to fail. That's why over $455 billion will be spent this year alone on digital ads. Here's a better way to use the Love Island hype to sell more products. Create TikToks using trending hashtags. Create on-trend Facebook and Instagram adverts during Love Island and post memes. Do those three things, and I can bet that you'll see a better return on investment than those spending 100k on one advert. I must point out that Les Binet, is it Binet or Binet? Les Binet, yeah. Uh, commented on this post just saying uh, LMAO. So uh, what do you make of that? Well, um, how long have you got? Um, <laughs> uh, I would say that as a, I'm guessing this is someone either from a digital agency or a digital salesperson. Um, <laughs> and we get this a lot. I mean, I've, I've worked in media for 25 years, media agencies and ITV, and um, people have spent all that time talking about the death of traditional television, TV, etc. And yet, it is stronger than ever. Um, and, you know, the, the cost of advertising, like I said earlier, is driven by a supply and demand metric. So I'm not going to comment on how much a spot in, in Love Island costs, but you've got audiences across linear and VOD of, for this year's show in excess of 4 million. And it's an audience who you cannot reach elsewhere in that kind of mass simultaneous reach way fully engage the context of your show, the emotional connection that people have with that, the shareability of that is a hugely important social currency and a way for brands to engage. 
And I would uh, I, I would be inclined to, to kind of share with that uh, particular person who uh, posted that, uh, all the brands who did uh, uh, advertise around that, who were also using TikTok and Instagram. And this is not an either or. This is a this is an and. Mm-hmm. You know, this is this is how all these platforms working together can help to grow a business. And and I think too often. Um, this is seen as a very attritional thing. You either spend all of your money on ITV or you spend all of your money on TikTok. The reality is, for brands, depending on your audience, you need a blend. It's really interesting, actually, because um, increasingly digital social platforms Mm -hmm. are working in partnership with us around our show. So Tinder was our data partner around um, Love Island. We've done a great TikTok partnership, uh, which you might see in a film a bit later, uh, around Saturday Night Takeaway last year. And these brands are looking at ways in which they can harness the contacts, that that emotional connection we have with our audience to help to build their own platforms. So um, I think it's, it's a very simplistic view of the world. To go on to what Les Binette said, so it's a great work that Les Binette and Peter Field have done, which I'm sure Rory Sutherland talks about as well, which is the looking long and at, short of it. The long and short of it, and looking at the balance of brand building and activation mm-hmm. and recognising that depending on the category you're in, that if you're looking to drive long medium and short-term business effects, so actually business effects rather than immediate campaign response effects, yeah. then you have to look at getting the right balance there. Um, and, and I think increasingly where ITV is now is trying to get a better balance between our ability to deliver, um, you know, almost at the top of the, the marketing funnel, but also at the middle and the bottom of the funnel and, yeah. and, and trying to deliver things that are, that are brand building as well as driving activation. Yeah, I want to. Uh, I want to return to the content and the ITV stuff in a minute. But as a briefly as a sales guy, I was interested then that you were um, promoting the benefits of, like, say, long term business effect thinking as opposed to short term, you know, uh, engagement. Sales marks, yeah, exactly. Yeah. How do you manage that as a sales guy? Because obviously, I've had um, compared to you a modicum of uh, experience in trying to, you know, trying to drive immediate success. How do you balance? trying to uh, keep the bigger picture in focus whilst wrestling with the day-to-day of trying to, you know, get whatever's in the pipeline closed yeah, off. Yeah. Um, well, well I, I, there's probably two, two ways to answer that. One is how do we manage that in our conversations with advertisers and agencies? And secondly, how do we manage it in terms of our own planning? In terms of conversations with advertisers and agencies, um, you know, we're only as good as the information we get. Mm-hmm. So, so knowing a campaign has worked or, or not worked is, is is down to us working collaboratively with with advertisers and agencies and what they share and and don't share. So we try and have those more collaborative kind of uh, two way dialogue. Um, I think one of the challenges that businesses have, whether they have uh, shareholders or, or, or looking at how their business is run, is sometimes they don't have the luxury of thinking about things in the long term saying to the city, you know, don't worry about how uh, this we've performed this quarter because we've got a three-year planning. And it's a balance. Mm. And it's a, sometimes about understanding the interrelationship between the short, medium, and long-term metrics, understanding how you're progressing on, on that. Um, I think... And, and and it's not it's not a one size fits all. You know, for many businesses, certainly at an early stage of their growth, they have to think about how do they get through the next month, the next quarter, yeah. and 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 scale up accordingly. So, so for us, we have to think how can we support businesses in a number of ways. How can we support them on measuring this campaign as much as building a, a longer term plan? It's just understanding what the brief is, yeah. much like you have to do as well. And then, I suppose from our business perspective. It's just a lot of plate spinning, you know. It's it's what we do today. It's how we think about what's coming down the line, how we plan for tomorrow as well, and having things, you know, we're planning stuff now that's going to come to fruition back end of next year, but yeah. it's because it needs planning now. So, yeah, and I presume that kind of thing is not anything you're even remotely at liberty to discuss if it's for the back end of next year. Well, I, I mean, the stuff I can talk about, you know, one of the things that a lot of businesses are are thinking about now is what the impacts of the Football World Cup will be in <laughs> November, December next year. Yeah, we need now. to talk about the Euros in a minute, don't and we? We'll talk about the Euros, but, but Football World Cup, so, so it's unusual in that it's happening in November, December. It'd normally be the summer, it's in Qatar because of the weather. And and the the, the 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 thing to consider there is is it's a really busy time for retail and, yeah. and often retail brands in their build up to Christmas aren't necessarily talking to the same audience you might do with a, a campaign around football. Normally, the World Cup is well clear of any big. Normally, yeah, yeah in, in in it would be it would have been next summer. And then um, equally, we've got a we've got a schedule to manage within that. We've mm. we've got to kind of balance things. We've got a whole regulatory framework, so so we have to think now about that. Yeah. And that's just one of the things uh, yeah. we're considering. And more, more immediately, we've got things like um, 
Uh, I'm a celebrity launching next week. We've got an Adele special uh, next week. So, so we've kind of got, got some immediate things on the horizon too. Some nice uh, sort of baiting musical content there, yeah. getting me excited. Let's talk about briefly I'm a celebrity because as you can probably tell from the backdrop here, I'm a snob. This is this is a very loud wall that blasts out, look, we know more music than you do. We, you know. I bet you there's, there's probably someone, I, I know John Lydon's been on I'm a Celebrity. There's probably one or two people who are on there who've either been on I'm a Celebrity or tried to get on I'm a Celebrity. Probably not Gil Scott Heron though. No, but, no, no, no. no. But, um, <laughs> The point there being that you, uh, when we first spoke, and it was months ago now when we first said we were going to do this and we were on the phone talking about the fact that you said ITV uh, has an unashamed, uh, unashamed, unashamed, um, is unashamedly in touch with the mainstream. And um, that was something I actually had respect for because like we're saying, you can get with all this stuff and trying to, you know, trying to sell ourselves as these uh, creative, uh, as a creative business, what you're fundamentally doing is saying, um, you know, my knowledge of certain things is so niche that it's valuable. But, and that can that can cause you to go, well, mainstream stuff, that's a bit beneath me. But of course, that is uh, what a, a large, you know, there's, there's, it's, a, it's got a large audience and it's been a tremendous success, there's stuff like I'm a Celebrity. And, you know, it's good entertainment and it keeps people coming back every year. And how long has it been going now? 20 years? 20 years, yeah, 20 years. And Old you know, enough to be at uni. Uh, and the, uh, well, I suppose there's a couple of things here. One is how do you keep a brand going for 20 years like I'm a celebrity? Mm -hmm. and, and the second thing is, um, I'm just going to get rid of that. Um, the second thing is um, how, in fact, there's an I'm a celebrity thing I've got there. Um, the, um, the second thing <laughs> and, is and Decker on the phone. about the, the, um, that, that kind of mainstream appeal. I'll, I'll deal with the, the, the second point first, which is, is we're accountable to three sets of people. We're accountable to shareholders, accountable to audiences and we're accountable to advertisers, mm -hmm. right? And all of them want us to deliver big numbers, to drive mass reach and to be in touch with our audience, to understand what they want, to make shows that they want. We have an entire cultural unit, ITV, who help to um, feed the pipeline of how we think about commissioning. Uh, what are the, not just the, 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 the trends coming through, but also what are the kind of underlying universal trends that we need to think about tapping into. How do we make programs that appeal to people that engage the nation and again, engage them at scale? And that's part of our broader PSB remit and what, what we do you know, within UK society. But then taking something like I'm a Celebrity, it's about refreshing and evolving it and revolving it across, across that time. Um, and, and that's down to getting the right blend of people who go into the jungle each time or the castle. It's about the chemistry between Ant and Deck. It's about the fact that it's a, a show at heart about people getting on, not about falling out, yeah. whatever you might think about it. And and it's, um, you know, when we have made changes to it, often not through, uh, um, you know, wanting to. So when Holly Willoughby came in or when we moved to the castle, that that was circumstances that forced us. But, but you know, as as someone... One said, necessity is the mother of invention. And out of that comes something really powerful. And, and again, us going back to the castle this year is because of the fact that earlier in the summer, you know, I, I think we'd have loved to have gone to Australia, but uh, the uncertainty about whether we'd be able to get everyone over there without quarantine led yeah. us to make a decision. And yeah. hence it's in well, Australia have still have, have had some of the most res uh, conservative restrictions in yeah. those, haven't they? So it's been very much a locked border. And as well, they I believe they've been doing things like um, having apps where you have to take a photograph of yourself to show that you're at home or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, a bunch of celebrities and Anton Deck wouldn't necessarily have been wanting to, uh, to, to do that. So, so, it's, so we're in Wales, it'll be great. Uh, it had, you know, the, the, the last two or three years when we've been either in Wales or with Holly Willoughby have been almost record figures. And I think yeah. what's really interesting for, for, for brands to take from that is you can take a brand that's a household name and has been here for many years but keep it as fresh and relevant and resonant as ever. And it's about how you kind of refresh that brand, how you listen to your audience, mm. how you take elements of that and bring new elements in. I mean, with last year's show, there was something really vicariously uh, heartwarming about it because as I was saying, I'm not like a typical, <laughs> I'm a celebrity viewer. All your secret things come out now. So. Oh yeah, the skeletons come out of the closet. I was with my, with my girlfriend and she was like, start, I'm a celebrity. I was like, yeah, I want to see people getting together because we were in another lockdown yeah. last November. And there was something, like we say, it was vicarious entertainment and seeing uh, Vernon Kay and everyone at the top of the cliff and saying, oh, they're, they're all together. Maybe we can do that again sometime. It, it actually gave more of a, an emotional lift than I expected it to. It does. And, and, and I think, you know, there's no God-given right why people tune in at nine o'clock in the evening every night, um, you know, to, to, to watch programmes that we schedule. But, but we curate a schedule that tries to match the moods and mindsets of the people. And we have to try and predict it weeks, months in advance. 
you don't get it always right. You know, no. it's an art, not a science, but but it's about trying to be there and have a great, yeah. you know, piece of entertainment for people. You mentioned days, weeks, months in advance. Now we're going to talk a little bit about being more reactive and more instantaneous. I was in this very studio uh, with uh, Aaron, uh, who's in there, not featuring at all on this podcast ever, but just being the sound engineer. Uh, we were working on something. He was on Zoom, in fact, at home. And he just stopped uh, in the middle of what we were doing. I was on a mix for a TV show. And he, I was like, what's going on? He's like, just Christian Eriksen's just collapsed. And it was watching history unfold. And we were like, is he going to make it out of this? And thank God things, you know, turn out for the best. Uh, but you turned something around um, Re- reacting to that is that right is that was yeah, it an ITV yeah, creative yeah. we we um I think that match actually was on the BBC because the way we split the matches uh, across tournaments with with the Beebs that was on on the BBC and we um at, by the way the the fixtures worked out we had the next Denmark match yeah uh, on ITV I can't, I can't recall off the top of my head who they were playing and uh, a few years ago we'd done a, a really successful campaign uh, with. British Heart Foundation with Vinnie Jones, which some people may remember, uh, where he was using uh, the track Staying Alive to teach how to do CPR. Oh, yeah. Uh, But it had not been on TV for ages. And actually, it was the quick thinking of people in and around Christian Eriksen at the time that ultimately, you know, supported him and saved him. So uh, one of our quick thinking sales team watching that match got in touch with the creative agency who'd worked on that campaign and said, look, is is there any way that we could use this as a moment in time to just remind people how to react in those in that situation? And uh, Vinnie Jones, uh, yeah, so, so he was in Australia at the time, and uh, in the matter of about three or four days, uh, we turned uh, this ad around, which I think we're going to see uh, now. Yeah, all right, let's have a look at this. This is the ad we never expected to make. This should be about pre-match banter about whether the lineup's right or wrong. About kicking off a summer we've all been waiting for. With everyone in every local. But sometimes unexpected things happen. But knowing CPR could make the difference. Help us save more lives by learning CPR. It's really interesting so, that because it doesn't directly reference Christian Eriksen, but everyone will have known exactly what you're getting at. And it ran just in the build-up to that 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 next Denmark game. Uh, there'd obviously been a lot of talk in the pre-match around it, and uh, it was hugely successful. You know, it didn't cost a huge amount of money to make it, mm-hmm. or for the ad space, arguably, but the impact had was enormous. And in fact, recently that won the Grand Prix at the Media Week Awards. Great for best campaign over the last year. Yeah, um, and it was quick thinking from our sales team that kind of um, helped to do that. So shows power of advertising. Yeah, power of advertising. And um, that kind of reactive behavior is something that uh, I really struggle with thinking, you know, can we do this in such a short space of time and having the facility and uh, the means and of course the, the contact book to be able to just go, let's do this now. As well, the fact that when it's a charitable cause, often that's much more justifiable, isn't it? Like we need to do this now. That need is... Very explicit with uh, Christian Eriksen. Yeah, and, but, but I think a lot of the best stuff that we've done creatively with brands and agencies over the last, God, seven or eight years has not has been driven out of, of the art of the possible and things that haven't been done before, whether yeah. it's working with talent or IP, whether it's things that are off screen, often for, for great social purpose causes as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think one of the things that really drives us as a sales team is not just the ability to 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 get brands to advertise and help them scale up, but also coming up with great creative solutions that, that capture, you know, the hearts and minds of people. Will, I mean, uh, we're talking about I'm a Celebrity, we're talking about using brands and reactivity and IP. And of course, Christmas is coming up. Uh, I, you, you mentioned uh, once upon a time, not too long ago, that you had this idea, maybe not you had this idea, but Gosh. you know what I mean? This idea came out around uh, the naughty list thing with Tesco, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, again, not me. Um, <laughs> three hundred of us in in the commercial sales team. So I'm I'm just the person here today. But um, the so so I think what where this comes from is actually a, a great example of how we collaborate with with advertisers and agencies. Sometimes it's about creating campaigns from scratch. Sometimes it's about amplifying campaigns that are already running. And one of the one of the great things that ITV is because we 
big part of our business is studios, which makes programs. So a huge amount of the IP for the programs that are on ITV that brands advertise around, we own the IP for. So that enables us to think about how we can use that IP across lots of platforms in very innovative ways, as, as, as we'll kind of talk about in one of the films we, we, we show in a, in a bit. Um, but, but particularly around the Tesco's campaign, uh, as many of you may remember, the Christmas campaign last year was around whether you were or weren't on the naughty list and what that might mean for what you got for Christmas and what you could or couldn't have. And uh, working with Tesco's and their agencies, um, we worked out a great way to amplify that around uh, uh, I'm a Celebrity. And it was essentially getting some of the people as they came out, as they were voted off, They'd got on the naughty list with viewers and therefore they'd been, been voted off the show and getting them as they came out and, uh, and, and filming a piece of content uh, which ran out in, in the next day or two. So still fresh in the minds, that was the person who, who, who left the castle the day before about whether or not they were on the naughty list. So a great little campaign. Again, huge reach, huge traction, huge cut through of Tesco's Christmas campaign and contributed to, to sales growth as well. So really, really impactful. And of course, for those of us uh, on the musical side of things, that uh, campaign was notorious for blasting Oops, I Did It Again back into everyone's ears, you know, so. It, it was, yeah, I absolutely. no idea what they paid for that track, but I'm sure it <laughs> was a pretty expensive Christmas <laughs> gift for Tesco. Yeah, uh, you talk about, you've been talking about the fact that you have your own IP, and that was another thing when we were first talking um, some time ago that surprised me um, was just the sheer amount of original content that ITV actually produces, not only for ITV, but for other partners, because you have a substantial production capability. We, we do, yeah. We've got, there's round about, oh gosh, in excess of 50 different labels that fit under our studios uh, division, the biggest of which is Talpa that many people would know uh, from, from things like The Voice, which is the biggest program for right. around the world. Um, but that's, th those uh, labels under studios uh, drives a huge amount of uh, the programming for ITV, around about two thirds of what we, we, we uh, have on screen, we, we make, but we also make a lot for other channels. So, so just to give you a bit of a, a smattering of some of the things that you might have seen across different channels and not known that came from ITV studios, but on, on the BBC Vigil this year, uh, we've got Outlaws at the moment, if you're watching that, uh, you've got Snowpiercer on, on uh, Netflix, you've got Gamora as well, which is big in Italy. We own the production company there. Um, and, and obviously things like, we, we then have shows which are hugely successful, which we take around the world, which, which run in their own localized vers versions and variants like, like Love Island and, and I'm a Celebrity as well. So um, it, it's a huge part of our business, drives a, a big amount of revenue, is mm -hmm. driving great growth at the moment. Um, and, uh, you know, it is again how we future-proof ourselves because those labels work right across all the genres from drama through to entertainment. And we've got kind of in-house teams as well here in Media City alongside that as part of that mix. It's always funny because I hear a lot of people making noise about saying our ah, traditional media, the death of traditional media, they must be really, or, you know, running scared of people like Netflix. And then, you know, you hear something like that saying, we're actually working in partnership with all those things and we are plugged into the, the future well, in that way. You know, I think it's, Studios is a, is a, is a business is a, in its own right. It, it can't, rely solely on ITV to drive all of the the income and the programs for it. So it goes out and wins commissions with other channels. And, and that means you get the likes of Netflix and the BBC paying ITV. That helps to drive our profitability. I mean, you know, it goes without saying that the the, the overall budgets that, that say Netflix or Amazon or Disney have are huge compared to, to ITV, but they're working across a global market and across multiple territories. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I would argue over the last 10 years that that's led to ITV and others up in their game. So, so the amount spent on, on an hour of drama now versus 10 years ago has grown. And it's grown yeah. because actually the kind of quality expectations of the audience have grown. Absolutely, so, yeah. So, so it's important that we kind of offer yeah. that choice in market and we're offering quality. I apologize to any of our either nostalgic <laughs> advertisers who are listening, advertising creatives, or people who genuinely disagree with this perspective. But I showed my one of my friends the old British Airways advert. It was made by Saatchi and it was called Face. Do you remember the one where there's they got yes. coordinated yeah. um not dancers exactly, but it's like performance art, yeah, where they assembled a face. And there was a um, sort of remix of the original Lacme opera piece. The point is, uh, it actually looked pretty bad. <laughs> you know, looking back at it now, and my mate said it's because everyone has cinematic expectations for content now. All TV drama has to look as good as 
what was what's on at the movies. Whereas it used to be the case that we had a distinction between those two levels of quality. Yeah, but I, I would argue, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk in recent years about the about TV arguably replacing cinema. So forget forget lockdown, but many of the biggest mm. stars of cinema have moved over to TV. Yeah. As the as the media of choice, mm-hmm. and that's because the ability to tell a story over episodically over six eight episodes right. it, it far exceeds um, what you can do in yes. a film. And whilst the budgets may be different, actually that the, the it, it provides a really really rich canvas. You only have to think about Hollywood style actors who have uh, appeared on TV, whether it's ITV, Netflix, what have you. So yeah, in fact we we were. Um... Chris, who's behind the camera now, we were talking about this on a drive back from London last week. We were saying uh, that with the old um, the old form content, but there is some really distinctive uh, classic stories, novels, huge things, you know, Crime and Punishment, Dostoevsky, things like this, War and Peace, Tolstoy, that people have not really attempted seriously to put on film in a big budget way because there's just, it's too dense to put into two hours and now people have the capability to basically make a 10 or 13 hour film and of course people do binge watch them as if they're one piece of content but well yeah. that's a, it's an interesting point because i think what you, you talked about how we're competing with the likes of netflix and amazon one of the things that we've evolved significantly over the last year and it's probably going to become part of what we do going forward and we're not alone in this that mm-hmm. we've been trying to do is is where we run a new drama and when the first episode lands, we'll then put the entire series on ITV Hub so that if you are the kind of person who cannot wait till this time next week to watch episode two, you can binge watch it. Yeah. Um, and uh, we don't do it for every drama. So anyone who's watching, say, Succession at the moment is probably itching to be able to see the entire series. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, for selected dramas, that works for us. In the same way, we might look at things running across consecutive nights as we are at the moment with The Tower. You know, it's about working out what's right for a given drama. Yeah. Let's take a little um, sidestep back into lockdown territory because I was really interested to hear what uh, was going on behind the scenes with the, what did you call it, the People's people's Ad Break? The People's, yeah. So, so um, well, this was, we're going to show a couple of examples of this in a moment, but just to give a little bit of context. So, so cast your minds back to, hmm. to last summer. We're, we're all at home. We're all watching more TV. We're all enjoying the sunshine, but all a little bit bored. Yeah. We're trying to entertain the kids and doing a bit of homeschooling. And and, and I think what, what we recognised then, we were seeing all these people who had learnt new hobbies and crafts and discovering ways in which they could be creative. And this was if they weren't getting a dog, by the way. Yeah, of course. Um, and, uh, and, and we thought, well, let, let, let's harness this because one of the challenges we were finding was because of the way that, that the, the ad industry was, it was difficult to go and make new ads. So we launched this competition to harness the creativity of the nation. And we, we said, look, why don't you... We, we put a challenge out to people to go and recreate iconic ads of the recent past in their own style. And we said, we will, um, with the blessing of those advertisers, uh, just, just to be clear. And we gave them a, a bunch of adverts to go and choose from. And we said, the best ones will run on ITV in one of our primetime shows. Uh, and it was voted by various luminaries from the uh, the creative industries and, and our kind of creative heads internally. Uh, and we got some amazing creativity and just kind of shows how creativity doesn't just exist in the ad industry, it exists at the nation at large. So I think we're going to show... Uh, we're going to show um, the winner of that competition, um, but also we're going to show a, a personal favourite as well. So I don't know which one you want to show first. So which one was the winner? The, the winner was was Aldi, and the, my personal favourite was the Honda one. So I'm with um, you on that, yeah. So I'll let you choose which one you want to show first, but this is People's Ad Break. We'll look at Aldi first and have Honda for dessert. Great. <laughs> my name is Arthur. It's nearly dinner time. I like that dog food. I like that dog food. I also like cats. I think I thought that was a real <laughs> ad because of the quality of the voice at first. It's it's amazing, and, and you know, obviously we got the blessing of of Aldi for that, and 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 McCann as well, and they they loved it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the well deserved winner. If you put animals in that, always going to win. That's yeah. what System One say. So uh, yeah, but then I think for. Just, uh, this obviously wasn't one take, but I just think for sheer ingenuity, this version of the famous Honda Cog ad, I think, just takes the biscuit. It was a very close second. Very disappointing that you said it wasn't one take. I was actually convinced. (laughs) Let's have a look. (laughs) 
<laughs> Isn't it nice when things just work? It's that laughter at the end, I think. It just, you, know, you almost couldn't believe that they got it to work. It's so, the real uh, humanity. I think it just shows the creativity of the nation. We've not repeated it, but we kind of, you know, we may bring it back at some stage. Who did that? Time. Like, yeah. I can't remember what they were called, but uh, it was just members of the public. You know, it was, yeah. it was a, we ran a, a campaign on air to, to, as a call out to people's creativity, gave them a deadline, created a page for them to go and get some inspiration. They uploaded their films. We obviously made it broadcast ready. Uh, and obviously showed Honda and Aldi before those went live, but amazing creativity. Shout out to the general oh, public. Yes. <laughs> uh, what else have we got here? Um... I can suggest if you... If well, the thing you, is, yeah, because I've done this thing where I was like, flipping heck, because <laughs> I've done what I do, which is I go Sorry. well off script. <laughs> so yeah, so this just, this just shows everything that we produced over the last year. Huge audiences... Uh, right across the, the the genres here, and and mass audiences, as I said earlier, is what it's all about. It's yeah. Great talent, launching new dramas, delivering significant numbers there, as you can kind of see on on screen. Um, who can forget the the Euros and the massive audiences we got there? Um, and and you know, lest we forget, some of these shows are shows that we've scaled up over time, like Mars Singer. Yeah, uh, that you you saw there. Now now drama and the soaps are a real stalwart of our schedule. Um, but but sometimes we don't always get the, the kind of credit we deserve for our news coverage and our yeah. factual entertainment uh, and getting into the heart of that story. And, and who can forget the kind of coverage we've had on Good Morning Britain this year? <laughs> but as I said earlier, ITV Hub is is growing at a rate of knots, a hugely important part of our schedule, not just for Love Island, but also for, for drama in, in the round. And it's going to become an ever bigger part as we go forward. And we're seeing more and more people who are essentially not always watching our linear schedule when we uh, have that, who, who, who watch through the hub. Yeah. Huge specials like the Harry and Meghan and we've got Adele coming up as well. But also the way that we work with advertisers, we've touched on this. So we've got Planet VR, programmatic platform to enable brands to, to plan, buy and optimise, but also the work we've done around COP26 and Home Planet. And we're working more and more with brands on making shows like uh, Cooking with the Stars. Um, I touched a bit on some of the partners we've had around Love Island, uh, like uh, Tinder there. Um, yeah. And, and you know, it's also about recognising the role that we can play in wider society around some of our social purpose initiatives from Eat Them to Defeat Them uh, uh, amongst them. And, and I think it's making sure you've got a strong pipeline of stuff. So some of the stuff showing here is things that has, have run subsequently over the last couple of months from Manhunt to Stephen to the Larkins. And again, recognising that we have different audiences and re uh, producing shows for, for all of them. Yeah. Some of the stuff you'll see on here is coming up in the, in the coming months. We had the long call... Uh, last week on there. Flipping and, heck, I remember uh, that one. <laughs> the, the, uh, <laughs> I just fell off my bike. I was 10 when that happened. Sorry. World Cup uh, qualifiers. <laughs> and, and, and you know, recognising that actually what you can do is you can blend the categories so you can make travel shows that have entertainment like Gordon, Gino and, and Fred. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, right across those genres, a, a real uh, diverse selection of things that we produce. Uh, and, you know, you're working in a live dynamic space so you've got to kind of, we're producing a schedule every single day yeah. to appeal to different audiences. You know, I've, it, what I did forget until taking a look at that, how diverse the offering is, because I I tend to only think of ITV as what's on between seven and nine on, for, you know, weeknights. I don't, I don't know why that is. That's just my perception, probably because that's when I grew up watching <laughs> ITV. Well, yeah, potentially. And, and the thing is, you know, as you go through life stages, uh, you know, when you're young, when you're at uni, when you've got pre-kids, with kids, etc., you know, you're you're media behavior as much as all of your your downtime you know waxes and wanes very differently so, so that think, sounds like a warning said to someone like no, me no, no. <laughs> I, th I think i think it's just you know it, it's it's just one of those things i think what we have to do is recognize that doesn't stand still so what someone yeah. of my age does now versus what they might have done 30 years ago is very very different so how do you make sure you appeal how, how do you make sure that your brand is in as many, you know, your programs are in as many different places. And we are very much digital first. Yes. So, so that's recognising that we have no God-given right for people to tune in at 9pm on a Tuesday to watch a show that we choose to put there. Mm -hmm. And so it's recognising that actually we need to work harder to, to get those audiences and see those audiences in the round, both live linear, live on uh, ITV Hub, and then also that catch-up potential as well, maximising that reach. I was, I was quite em uh, emotionally struck when watching that stuff, which I didn't expect to be saying, because one of the things that I find about our modern age is that 
it's not I find, it's self-evident to everyone that there's no, there's increasingly less and less of a centralized experience that everyone has. So for example, when you look at something like Oasis at Nebworth in 96, uh, the only way that was possible for a band to become that big was because generally everyone was consuming from a, a narrow number of media channels. You had, you know, BBC, Top of the Pops, you had yeah. radio stations. But... I'd, I'd, I'd challenge that though, because if you look at some of the numbers on, on that film there, mm -hmm. and I appreciate we picked out some of the bigger ones there, but, you know, we're making shows that are watched by millions yeah. simultaneously. And if you're a brand and thinking, how can I get my message across to as many people as possible as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. there, there is no other platform to do that. You know, whilst you'll see some great viewing figures on the BBC, if say strictly, you can't advertise in that. And whilst you might see some big numbers um, uh, put out there for what you can achieve in digital, such as from our good friend who was challenging the cost of Love Island advertising, um, you know, it's not, it's fragmented. Mm -hmm. It's across multiple different places. So getting a concentrated audience, and I would argue the reason why you still see that at TV is because as a as a race, humans love to do stuff together. They, they don't want to be missing out on something that is the currency, the, the, the debate, and social media has actually enabled that more yeah. than anything else. That's kind of what I was aiming at with my diatribe about the lost days of the 90s, because <laughs> uh, watching that made me feel like, ah, that's where <laughs> that's where the you know everyone is, that's where everyone's attention is. De definitely, you know, yeah. I, Because I'm someone who only consumes sort of fragmented digital media, a few podcasts here, a bit of Spotify yeah. there, and some Netflix. I feel like I'm not plugged into anyone else's stream. And like you said, people like to do things together. One of the benefits... For bizarrely enough, for the audience, for something like ITV is feeling like you're on the same page as everyone else. Well, I, I've got no doubt whether you admit it or not that in the next two or three weeks you'll be you'll be hooked on I'm a Celebrity, <laughs> uh, and we've got we've got a few other new entertainment formats coming down, down the line because I think it's it's easy to see what ITV does as as the things that we've been doing for for years. We've been talking about I'm a Celebrity, for instance, mm -hmm. we've got a number of new entertainment formats coming. So we've got a new. Simon Cow vehicle fronted by uh, Maya Jama just before Christmas called Walk the Line. Okay. Um, Where everyone sings Johnny Cash. Uh, <laughs> I, I couldn't possibly say. And then in the new year, we've got a new uh, Anton Deck co-produced show called Limitless Win with unlimited prizes, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, they are part of. And then we've got a uh, re reimagined version of Stars on the Rise called Starstruck, which is going to be fronted by Ollie Murs uh, following that. And that's alongside all the other formats we've got. So that's just a a snippet, yeah. more and more sports. We've got the FA Cup now yeah. and, and Lionesses, so a whole run, rain, you know, range of sports well on ITV. We've, we've just about done an hour, but before uh, we, we wrap this up, I need to hear about the Adele. So it's uh, next Sunday at yeah, the time of recording. Adele special on ITV uh, as launched by her in her social uh, media. So is, um, it's kind of almost like a bit of a comeback, not specifically because she never got fell out of favour, but it's been a while since we've seen, because I remember the, seeing an Adele special on ITV about a decade ago. Yeah, it's, um, uh, well, she's got her, her new album. I think she's got an Oprah show as well, because uh, in this day and age, you can't go anywhere without an Oprah show. I, I don't think we've got that uh, as, as things stand, to be to be frank. But I think, um, you know, it's, it's a big coup for us. Um, and we are really looking forward to broadcast. I mean, there'll be lots of advertiser demand around it. Mm -hmm. and, and again, it's about driving those much talked about moments where the nation come together. Yeah, it really is. That's what the, the insane thing about Adele is just the, again, after a, a decade, um, still an insanely magnetic draw for a mass audience. Um, as a brief aside on the music thing, I was saying this about Coldplay recently because they just signed another multiple album deal. It's like their debut album was 21 years ago. Was it 22 years ago, 99? I can't remember. But um, <laughs> point is, it's like imagine the Human League signing another multi-album deal and being on Radio 1 in the year 2000. Yeah, well, really yeah. weird. I, th I think they're probably on tour at the moment, as things stand. <laughs> yeah, but they've got a very savvy business uh, strategy. So, anyway, so really, what I hope this film does, it sort of brings to life the ways we're working with brands. So, I've talked a bit about the likes of Tesco and whatever. And for those who are thinking, what is he talking about? What does that look like? This shows a little bit about how we're working with brands. So I think the thing to think about here is 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 two things. We've got two phrases. One is it around how we think about integration in both a horizontal way as well as a vertical way. So how do we how do we work with lots of brands across one show? And how do we also work with one brand across lots of different streams? Yeah. And and the other thing is is this is about thinking about all the touch points that we might have with a with a with a viewer or a consumer. And when we're working with brands, is thinking about what are the ways that IP can be brought to life? How can we work with talent? How can we think about the art of the possible? So for any creatives out there, hopefully this is a bit of inspiration, a bit of a call to arms to come and 
get in touch and see what we can do with the brands you're working with. So okay. I'll, um, I'll talk over this as this is um, without sound. So introduce nicely by Anton Deck. Sorry, you can't hear them. We are rolling that this. now. So this is really about how we we work better together with, with brands. This is VW uh, driving through ITV sets. Uh, it is uh, the naughty list uh, for Tesco. It's uh, the partnerships we've done around uh, Love Island. Um, it's the partnerships we've done with TikTok. The infamous well. TikTok, yeah. Um, but, you know, the, the way to think of it is, is, first of all, in terms of the way we work with, with M&S, we work with them on not only their advertising and their sponsorship of Britain's Got Talent, all the lovely idents and products they did around that, but the way we created fresh market updates with Lucy Verasami, going back to the farms where the products were met, uh, are, are grown, and then creating a show, M&S Cooking with the Stars, an ad-funded program that we ran this year on ITV that they brought to life across their platforms. And then thinking about Coronation Street and how we work with a number of brands from product placement through to sponsorship, whether it be Costa, Co-op, uh, whether it be EE, Purple Bricks, right through to Argos. Um, and, it's almost uh, like a James Bond film. It, it is, yeah. And then uh, Love Island, all of the partners around that, the way that we work with Just Eat, Spotify, uh, Tinder, I saw it first, uh, and uh, Cloud9, Boots, uh, in a whole range of ways. So, so the list is, is, is endless. But it works incredibly well, and it's driving growth for those brands there. Moving into areas like Shoppable, moving into ways in which we can work with B2B brands, so whether it be eBay or NatWest around driving the SME propositions. Um, and I think what we're trying to do is be more all-encompassing uh, and thinking about innovative ways that we can weave those brands into our show, such as TikTok into uh, Saturday uh, Night Takeaway, right across all the different uh, genres here. And uh, yeah, as I said overall, the proof is in the pudding. If brands aren't seeing the growth in terms of uh, sales and uh, metrics off the back of it, they aren't going to do these things again and come back to us. But we've got a huge number of case studies and a huge appetite to go and create and work better together with advertisers, media agents, and creative agencies to do that. So, Jason thank you very Spencer, much. that was like, uh, what's that Radio 4 show? Uh, I sound very old. <laughs> where they like have to not, they have to give a, uh, just a spontaneous, a minute. just a minute, just spontaneous a minute. speech. Uh, there was probably a bit of repetition or, there. Yeah. So you could have caught me out on that, I think. It's all right. What we'll do is we'll instigate a little competition with the ITV biz dev team and we'll say, uh, yeah, there's a, a podium and you have to get up and uh, we'll do our own version of Open that. Open mic, yeah. yeah. Podium. Jason so, Spencer, thanks very much. Thank you very much for having us. It's been really good. Yeah. Thanks. Cheers.